or your teacher hasn't said anything to you is that uh, this Monday I'm doing units one and two. Wednesday I'm doing units three and four. Next Monday I'm doing units five and six. Next Wednesday I'm doing units seven and eight. And then the last week, which is the week of your AP test or the week right before, yeah, the week of your AP test. Um, unit nine is just for my ultimate review packet subscribers. And then I'm doing on that Wednesday, a writing workshop, or I'm calling it a writing lab. And again, that's only for my ultimate review packet subscribers, because while I love all of you, and while I love this content, um, you know, I want to also get paid to do this. So not just for free and not just out of the goodness of my heart. We're gonna get started in two minutes, please, please, please. Paper, paper, writing utensil, not a computer, not your phone. In fact, throw your phone across the room right now so that you have undivided focused attention on what I'm about to say for the next 45 minutes. Yo, multiple choice. Oh, read. Here's my hint for multiple choice. I'll give this to you as a freebie because you're here early. What you need to do, because every multiple choice question comes with a stimulus. So that is going to be like a quote or a graph or an image. Just read the source. Start with whatever the source says, because it'll always tell you the source. It'll give you an author. It'll give you a time period. And if you know enough about European history, you probably might not even have to read through the entire source in order to accurately answer the question. It starts in one minute. Okay, it is officially start time. I'm actually going to give you one more minute because I feel like some people are going to trickle in a little bit late. So please literally turn your phone off, throw it across the room, grab out some paper, grab out a writing utensil. I'm going to break this down by covering all of unit one and then all of unit two and then kind of a big what you absolutely need to know if you tuned out of everything else <laughs> at the very end of this. My hope is that this is going to take 35 to 45 minutes. And then at the end, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have, but I'm going to do a hard stop at 7 p.m. my time. So within one hour, we're going to get started in like a minute and a half. Make sure you have everything that you need. Text all your friends, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, this will be recorded. Also, be respectful human beings in the chat. I feel like I shouldn't have to say that. But, you know, I am a high school teacher, so I do feel like I need to say that. Just be kind. Okay. Okay. I've also never done a live before, so hopefully this works out really well. Let's get it. Students, welcome to unit one, Renaissance and Exploration. What we're covering today is actually period one of European history. So units one and two, Renaissance Reformation, and then age, Renaissance and Exploration, and then the Age of Reformation. And this is going to cover 20 to 30% of your test, which means that this stuff mainly the Renaissance, the Age of Exploration, and the Protestant Reformation are really important things that you do need to know about. As I'm going through this content, I'm not teaching you this for the first time. The point of me giving you this live review is to refresh and recap what you've already learned, specifically through looking at some skills. So unit one, Renaissance and Exploration, my guiding question that I will be walking through this entire lecture is how did the revival of trade culturally, economically, politically, and socially impact Europe? If we're looking at historical thinking skills, this thinking skill is causation. So if you are taking notes by hand right now, what I would ask you to do is make four columns or make four big boxes that say cultural, economics, politics, and social changes due to the Reformation. And that's how you can organize this because I'm going to go through big things that changed as a result of, sorry, the Renaissance, I'm getting ahead of myself. Big things that changed uh, as a result of trade and the start of the Renaissance in European history. And I'll make sure that you also write down things that you need to know which within each of those categories. 
Oh, there we go. Cool. Oh, students. The first five units of AP Euro are incredibly connected. And this is the one statement that overarching, overarchingly connects all of them. These early modern Europeans, once educated and literate, start to challenge traditionally held sources of power. And when we're looking at Europe in the 1400s and 1500s, what are those traditionally held sources of power? It's the Catholic Church and its longstanding absolute monarchies. So when we're looking at the Renaissance and the Reformation and the Scientific Revolution and the Enlightenment, all of these learned, educated, literate Europeans are going to be attacking those traditionally held sources of power in various ways to change what was happening in Europe. Next. Come on, we can do it. There we go. So let's start out with a little bit of contextualization and also students. Hold on. I got to make sure. It's through. Yes, yes, yes. It is. Okay, great. Um, so whenever you're writing any AP history test, the very first, any AP history essay, the very first thing that you should do is start out with this contextualization statement. So hopefully your teachers have already talked to you about that. That first paragraph on your AP history essays should be your contextualization and then your thesis statement. So contextualization just means what the heck is happening in the world so that I understand what's about to happen. So if I'm talking, if I'm trying to contextualize the start of the Renaissance, I need to talk about what happened in Europe prior to the Renaissance that makes the Renaissance this gigantic impetus of change. So key things that you need to know is that Rome falls 476-ish, and the thing that fills that political void after the fall of Rome is Catholicism. So people become united by a common religion rather than being united by a big empire. And Europe becomes increasingly shut off from trade from the outside world during their dark ages or during their middle ages. And the thing that brings them out of this dark age or their middle ages is the Crusades, which I have a map of here. And I'll come back to what my previous slide in a second. So um, these Crusades, quote, these holy wars um, in order to take back the Holy Land for the Christians were ultimately unsuccessful in that the Christians didn't long term control the Holy Land. But they ended up creating a lot of positive consequences for Europe because it opens them back up to the rest of the world, which, by the way, they were in their golden ages while Europe was in its dark ages. So a lot of these trade routes that went across Asia or across Northern Africa connected right in that Holy Land area or right through Constantinople. And now that Europe is going and interacting with that part of the world, they're getting reconnected to trade, which is very helpful and leads to the Renaissance. But it also leads to bad things like the Black Plague, which makes its way from Asia all the way across to Europe. And those two things together, the fact that the Black Plague wiped out an incredible amount of European population and that the Crusades linked Europe back up to all of these trade routes are going to help Europe enter into its rebirth. So Europe moves from its dark ages into its re renaissance or its rebirth. Mm -mm. <sighs> If I could teach this entire class through art, I would teach this entire class through art. I really like art because it serves as a visual anchor for your understanding and it helps you think back on, oh yes, this is this topic that I covered. And that is something that I really love about APRO because we have to talk about art all the time. This is a really great visual understanding of what life was like in Europe in the quote dark ages versus what life was like in Europe in the Renaissance after its rebirth. These paintings are painted oh, 120 years apart. And this shows a really wonderful example of how society and culture is changing in Europe. So if you look at this painting on the left, Madonna and Child and Glory, um, that would be like Mary and Jesus. Every, it's the heavens. We have a lot of spiritual figures. We have a lot of gold. Um, Europe in its dark ages was predominantly ruled by the power of the Catholic Church. And again, like I said, Christianity is what held Europe together during that time. So Academic interests were really centered on theology and learning more about the Bible. And life was focused on the heavens and like, maybe because life was kind of really bad 
depending on who you were, depending on, you know, if you're like a peasant or lower class person, which a majority of the people were, your life was probably pretty miserable in Europe during the Middle Ages. So rather than being focused on the here and now, you're probably more focused on what the afterlife would be like, what heaven would be like. So that dominated a lot of European thought. But then because of the Renaissance, you see this picture on the right. This is Raphael's School of Athens. You should absolutely know what this photo is or this image is. And this is showing, again, um, not only incorporating new artistic skills like perspective and a focal point, but it's also showing more diverse academic interests and this harkening back to Greece and Rome. Because the thing that really starts off the Renaissance is the fact that because Crusades and because Europe was now connected to the trade routes, and because they had stacked a lot of things within Constantinople, Byzantium, um, they were able to get back together all of these Greek and Roman texts, which they were like, oh my gosh, look where we came from. Look how smart we used to be. Look how educated we used to be. I bet we can get there again. So let's talk about cultural changes of the Renaissance. This is hopefully in your first column or your first square. Rather than there being a focus on the afterlife or only a focus on Christianity, there starts to be a focus on the individual. And this focus on individualism is also sometimes called humanism, this focus on human achievement and what you are able and capable of doing in this life. The word that you really need to associate with the Renaissance um, and its changes in Europe is secularism. So religious would be like the heavenly, secular would be the here and now in this earth. So when I'm talking about secular humanism, I'm again talking about not religious focus on the individual. And um, the printing press is in your, your CED, your course and exam description in this unit. I'm going to talk about it way later in the next unit. But Gutenberg's printing press helps facilitate a lot of these changes because people start to like write down the things that they're thinking about and it starts to get published and then widely circulated. And this is going to contribute to Europe being an increasingly literate population. But I'm going to get more to that when I talk about the Reformation because I think it plays a larger role there. But concomitant with that, going hand in hand with that, is the rise of vernacular languages. So vernacular is also a word that you need to know. Vernacular means your local language. In the Middle Ages in Europe, church services were done in Western Europe in Latin. And Latin was kind of the language of the elites. And now people are able to start thinking about themselves and thinking about the communities that they live in and are starting to write down their thoughts. They are not writing in Latin anymore. They are starting to write in French or in Italian or in German. So that vernacular language also becomes important over the course of the next couple hundred years in European history because it helps form national identities. Ooh, if we're looking at art, the Italian Renaissance focuses on a classical ideal. So again, they become... Um, Italian Renaissance artists become very focused on making muscular, strong men and everyone is naked. And you want to like hearken back to like this Greek and Roman glory of like what people used to look like. You also see a lot of mythology present in the Italian Renaissance, which again makes sense because you're reading through these Greek and Roman stories of myth and you're wanting to paint what you're seeing. With the Italian Renaissance, I also need you to think about Machiavelli. And hopefully you know who he is. He wrote a book called The Prince, which is going to set the stage for more secular, not religious, more worldly political institutions. Um, and that takes root for sure in Italy because he worked a lot with the Medici or the Medici family. And the Northern Renaissance retains more of a Christian focus. Um, if we're looking at this picture, oh, sorry, a picture on the left under the Italian Renaissance, that is the... Um, the Creation of Adam by Michelangelo and the picture on the right, this is actually The Last Judgment by one of my favorite Renaissance, Northern Renaissance artists, Hieronymus Bosch. When you think of the Northern Renaissance, you just need to think of like, it's pretty Christian. And also there are like lots of little people everywhere in all of the paintings. Um, and they started to focus more on naturalism and eventually realism in the Northern Renaissance. A good contrast to Machiavelli is Desiderius Erasmus, which, what a name, Desiderius, come on. Desiderius Erasmus wrote um, a ton of Christian-focused humanist books, 
So while he is still focusing on humans and like individual achievement, his focus is how they can better like serve the church and work together um, to bring like Christian ideals here. So we see that kind of Christian infusing within the Northern Renaissance. He wrote a book that I like to contrast with Machiavelli as the prince that is called An Education of a Christian Prince, in which he essentially outlines like what a what a great democratic utopian society could be like just super in contrast with what Machiavelli said of, um, you know, it's better to be feared than loved, than justify the means, all that stuff. <sighs> I know I'm going fast. It's okay. We'll be fine. Um, economic changes due to the, the revival of trade. <sighs> There's a lot that we need to cover here. And the CED really likes to talk a ton about the Columbian Exchange. So I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about that, which is what this image is representing right here. But before we do that, say it with me now. In 1492, Columbus sails the ocean blue. Columbus, this Italian, ended up getting sponsored by Ferdinand and Isabella and then tried to sail west across the Atlantic because he wanted to go find a route to India because that's where all of the very wealthy trade was located. And he couldn't go directly, um, kind of like if we're thinking about through Eastern Europe into like the modern day Middle East into India, because, because, because that was controlled by the Ottoman Empire the oft forgotten small child of AP European history, the Ottoman Empire. They play such a huge role in AP European history and they're mentioned twice in the CED. Anyway, Columbus sails the ocean blue in 1492, um, ends up trying to go to India, lands in Hispaniola in the Caribbean, and that sets up this connection between the old world or Africa, Europe, and Asia and the new world or the Americas. Why do we call it the new world? Because it was new to the Europeans. That's it. I like to call it the Americas. You should also call it the Americas. So that sets up this age of exploration in which these Western European countries, right? If you think about the ones that are like on the Atlantic that already have these sea powers, start to rapidly try to colonize as quickly as possible. And they try to colonize according to them as of gold, glory, and God. So they want literal like silver and gold bullion. So resources from the Americas. They want glory for themselves and the monarch who sent them. And they're doing this in the name of Christianity, specifically Catholicism, which I will talk more about in the next unit. And the Treaty of Tordesillas is, uh, if we're looking at the Iberian Peninsula, so Spain and Portugal, they are right next to each other in Europe. And they both colonized the Americas very shortly after each other. Um, they don't want to have a peninsular war happen between Spain and Portugal. So what they decide to do instead is they go to the Pope because they're both Catholic and they say, Hey Pope, please help us stop um, fighting each other. And let's like make sure that we can proactively come up with something where like you say what we can colonize and you say what we can colonize and then we can both agree to it. I'll come back to this. They create, eek. there we go. And we're looking at this map right here. Um, what's called the Treaty of Tordesillas. So the Treaty of Tordesillas is a line of demarcation that the Pope sends, or Pope kind of draws on a map. And he says, Spain, you can conquer and colonize everything to the west of this. Portugal, you can conquer and colonize everything to the east of this. So if we're looking at this map specifically right here, Portugal is what is in, what is this reddish purple color? Portugal gets increasingly involved in Indian Ocean trade, and they set up trade routes in modern day Indonesia, um, along the coast of India and along the coast of Africa. Portugal is a huge player in the age of exploration, but we don't often think about that because when we think about the age of exploration, we probably think about what's going on in the Americas. Portugal is in the Dutch Republic are increasingly involved in the Indian Ocean trade, whereas really Spain and England and France take over the Americas. Okay, so hemispheres are connected. New world, old world, now we're all joined together by like a two month-ish journey across the Atlantic Ocean. And this sets up what's called the Columbian Exchange. The AP test loves the Columbian Exchange. It is an exchange of goods, peoples, ideas, enslaved peoples and diseases from one region of the world to the other region of the world. And I have this map here. You should know like one or two things that come from the Americas and one or two things that come from Africa, Europe, and Asia, Afro-Eurasia. 
that would be really helpful for you in case this shows up as a short answer question or as an essay question. Just choose something right now. Corn from, comes from the Americas. Potatoes come from the Americas. Great. All of the animals and most of the diseases come from Afro-Eurasia. If you just know that, you'll be good to go. Something that is not talked about enough in AP European history is the transatlantic slave trade, aka the Middle Passage is specifically what I'm referring to. So the Connected Hemispheres sets up what's called the Triangle Trade, which is trade between the Americas to Europe, Europe to Africa, Africa to the Americas. And that Africa to the Americas route is called the Middle Passage. And that's where 12 million enslaved Africans were sent from Africa to the Americas to do terrible plantation labor. And it is kind of a passing footnote in AP European history. So know that that's called the Middle Passage. And I can talk way, way more about that later at the end of this if we have time. So other economic changes. Now that these European powers have colonies in the Americas, they use these colonies for their profit, which means that these European countries are adopting um, an economic theory or policy called mercantilism. They use the colonies, extract the resources out of their colonies, ship them back to the mother country, or the mother country makes them into usable goods and then sells them back to the colonies. That is becomes the dominating thought in economic theory until the 1700s. So for like 200 years, that's how European countries operate. They're extracting resources out of their colonies, making those resources into usable goods in Europe, and then selling them back to the colonies. Um, joint stock companies become important in England and in the Netherlands, sorry, the Dutch Republic. And they are ways that people can go in together to fund a voyage or fund an exploration somewhere so that if it fails, you're not totally out of all of your money because you shared in that expense with someone else. But if it's successful, you get to reap the benefits of that. And so do your best friends who helped you set up that joint stock company. The Dutch East India Company, we talk more about in unit three, but you know, it's the wealthiest company ever to have existed in all of world history because of their control of trade, specifically in Southeast Asia. Cool. Already talked about this. Ooh, no, there's one more thing I needed to say. When the Renaissance started, so like early, kind of late 1300s, early 1400s, through, the, through that 15th century, through the 1400s, the economic power of Europe was found in the Mediterranean region. So when Europe is connected, reconnected back up to all those trade routes, those trade routes are really coming through Italy. And in Italy, you see the rise of wealthy merchants who start to control trade and they start to establish banks. But when the hemispheres become connected in the early, I mean, late 1400s, early 1500s, we see that economic and political power shift from the Mediterranean region to the Atlantic region. And it's in that time period that you know, these Atlantic powerhouses so like Spain, France, Portugal, England, the Netherlands all become increasingly powerful because they're right on the sea and already have developed um, a lot of transportation, navigational technology and lots of ships. OK. Political changes due to this revival of trade. So. Because of the colonies, these new monarchs that control these countries that have established colonies in the Americas or in the Indian Ocean region become so, so wealthy. During Spain's conquest of modern day Latin America, they extracted, y'all, $10 trillion of gold over the course of the whole time. That's so much money. So like when we're saying, like, this is not chump change. They're making an incredible amount of money. And what these new monarchs do with that money is they consolidate their power. So they bring together and strengthen their power because they can and they have the money and why not do it? The way they do this is through religious control, which again, we're going to talk more about in unit two. And then also they start to build up standing armies and build up military to protect their country from other countries. So that's pretty important as well. Like I mentioned earlier, 
they're the monarchs are not the only ones gaining a lot of power yeah they're funding a lot of these expeditions but we also have merchant elites start to arise and start to control more wealth and power again if we're looking at italy like the medici family is a really good example of that um the ced wants you to know about henry the eighth and elizabeth the first as monarchs of england who consolidate their power through religion and the military and I will talk about them more in a later unit, but they wanted you to know about that right now. And this also seems strange to include here, but sure, time-wise, let's talk about it. Charles V, who's this guy in this picture right here? Oh, students, in your brain right now, can you please answer or just yell at your computer screen right now? Charles V was the leader of what empire? The Holy Roman Empire. Great, it's like Central Europe. Every most monarchs in Europe were somehow descended from the Holy Roman Empire or part of the Habsburg family for like hundreds of years. Anyway, Charles V in 1555 passes the Peace of Augsburg, which is saying that you can determine for yourself within the Holy Roman Empire if you want to practice Catholicism or Lutheranism. So this is, again, weird that it's part of this unit and not the next unit, but that's okay. Um, this is the first example of religious pluralism existing in Europe during this time period of all the new monarchs. So when I say the word religious pluralism, the term, it is that multiple religions, a plurality of religions, more than one religion, can exist at the same time with other religions in the same area. This is, becomes really important, especially when we get to religious wars. Okay, social changes due to trade. These things continue on for the next couple of hundred, hundreds of years in European history. So yeah, it starts in the 1400s, 1500s, but it will continue throughout the 1700s. The agricultural revolution happens, which just means that people start to learn how to plant better. And also we now have all of these nutrient dense crops from the Americas that are existing in Europe, which means that that's going to increase the food supply. That's the agricultural revolution. The commercial revolution is this slow change in how economic systems are structured in Europe, um, which I will, yeah, continues on as we Europe marches toward a market economy over the course of the next hundred, couple of hundred years. The enclosure movement, oh, this one makes me mad sometimes. Um, people used to share common land. Like if you were a peasant, if you were a serf, if you were a lower class person, like you and all your best friends in your community would like share common land that you could all use together to raise your livestock and to harvest your crops. And then wealthy people in Europe were like, I'm going to put a fence around this land so that you can't use it anymore. And that's what the enclosure movement is. You are literally enclosing pieces of land off so that not everyone in your community can use it, but only you can use it because then anything that you produce, that your slaves produce from that land will then just be yours and you can sell it for, for profit. Other things that you need to know about from this unit is that the little ice age occurs. This painting on the right is called, I forget what it's called, but it's by Peter Bruegel the Elder. And it just shows that a, a little ice age did happen. So that delayed childbearing and marriage for a while. But ultimately, that is going to even itself out as the agricultural revolution continues to increase population over time. And while the West is moving toward this like commercial revolution in the East, serfdom is codified. So serfdom is when you are a peasant who's tied to the land. Um, hopefully, you know about serfdom. OK, I'm trying to finish in like the next four minutes. Oh, this is perfect. Then we're going to take a quick little break. So I were to sum up everything that I just said about the effects of the revival of trade on Western Europe. Culturally, Europe underwent immense change as a result of the reacquisition of Greek and Roman texts, which spurred on humanist and secular thought. Rather than solely focusing on theology and religion, humanists began to explore new, diverse academic interests, which ultimately will lead to the Protestant Reformation, the Scientific Revolution, and the Enlightenment. Economically, hemispheres are connected, leading to a massive increase in resources and a massive increase in money to those who control trade or those who control these colonies. New economic elites emerge and Europe is marching toward a capitalist economic system. Just takes them a couple hundred years to get there. Politically, new monarchs 
excuse me, gained and consolidated their power with help from the wealth of their new world colonies. Competition to control this trade led to and will continue to lead to conflicts among these European states that are vying for power in the Atlantic. And socially, the population of Europe reached its pre-plague levels. Most Europeans still relied on agriculture and oriented their lives around the manor or village life. The commercial revolution and the enclosure movements in Western Europe led to urbanization, which is a continuity in European history from now until now, while in Eastern Europe, serfdom was codified or written into law. Okay, I did all of that very, very quickly, but again, trying to, so now I'm going to go back through and read all of your comments and see if I can help you answer any questions. Um, um, cool. We're just saying weird things. <sighs> Hi, everyone. I'm going to take a quick break. How are we feeling so far? Was that a lot? Was that too much? Do we remember any of that information? I'm going to get, I'm going to take a two minute break so my brain can slow down before I get started with the age of reformation. How are we doing? Tell me everything. Some of you remember some things. Don't worry, at the very end, I'm going to tell you everything you absolutely need to know. And then you can screenshot it, or you can write it down, or you can just watch this video again tomorrow and make sure that you know those vocab terms. Okay, are we locked in? Are we ready to go for round two? Okay, let's do this. Round two. Unit two. Age of Reformation. There we go. Same thing. I'm going to give you some guiding questions. I actually have two guiding questions for this unit just because we got to talk about the religious changes in general, and then also how those religious changes changed the rest of Europe. So what are core Protestant beliefs and how do they compare and contrast to Catholic beliefs? You do need to know the difference. You do need to be able to outline specific Protestant beliefs compared to Catholic beliefs. So that'll be the first thing that I talk about. Excuse me. And then how did the Protestant Reformation politically and culturally impact Europe? So Again, our historical thinking skill for that one's causation. Otherwise, we're going to practice comparison. So looking at Protestant versus Catholic beliefs. And then if you wanted to, in your notes, which you're hopefully taking by hand, make this happen, that could be great. Let's go. So again, I'll start out with contextualization every time, except for I literally just contextualized everything for you by talking about unit one. So in summary... Thanks to the Renaissance, Europe is in its cultural, economic, political, and social rebirth. Hey, a fun fact that I forgot to mention earlier, Plutarch, who is someone that you need to know that I will remind you of at the very end of all of this, Plutarch is actually the one who coined Europe being in its dark ages, and he did so in the late 1300s. I want to say it was like the 1390s, and I think that part of the reason that Plutarch did that is so that he could distinguish what was happening in Europe after the fall of Rome versus what was about to happen in Europe with the Renaissance. I just think that's an interesting little side note. There's a rise in literacy, again, thanks to the printing press, but that's also thanks to what's about to happen with the Protestant Reformation. And there's this focus in Europe on humans and human individual achievement. That is your contextualization that leads us to the Protestant Reformation. <sighs> October 31st, 1517, Martin Luther writes down 95 things that he disagrees with about the Catholic Church, and he nails them to a church door at Wittenberg. And this is what kind of kicks off the Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther was not the first of these Protestant reformers. There were actually many reformers who came before him. Jan Hus was a Bohemian guy who was burned at the stake. John Wycliffe was a reformer from England. You could argue that Desiderius Erasmus was one of the reformers too. But he had access to something that they didn't have. 
the printing press. And because he had access to that, he, and because more people were literate, and because more people were speaking German and reading in German and not just speaking Latin and reading in Latin, not that you would speak Latin, I guess, unless you were in the church, um, people were actually able, he was able to spread and disseminate his ideas throughout this increasingly literate public, which is what allowed the Protestant Reformation Reformation to take root when it did in the 1500s. His biggest critique of the Catholic Church was the sale of indulgences. And the reason that he hated the sale of indulgences is because Pope Leo X at the time was selling extra indulgences because he wanted to fund the construction of St. Peter's Basilica, which is the church that is within Vatican City where he would lead all of his church services. And um, Martin Luther was like, um, excuse me, Pope Leo X, in my study of the scriptures, I am reading that salvation comes through faith alone um, and not buying forgiveness for your sins. So what you're doing is wrong. And here are 95 other things that I don't like about you. John Galvin is another important reformer that you need to know about. What you need to do associate with John Calvin, I'm going to move down a little bit right here. Um, John Calvin focused a lot on predestination, which is the idea that before the foundations of the earth, God determined who was going to achieve salvation and who was not going to achieve salvation. And the Calvinists specifically focused on the Protestant work ethic or this idea that if you work really hard, God will reward your work by giving you lots of wealth. This will become important when we talk about the Dutch Republic and what's going on there. <laughs> Other key Protestant beliefs that are different than Catholic beliefs is sola fide, so salvation through faith alone, not by faith and works or faith and works and payment, which is what the Catholic Church had been teaching, and the primacy of scripture. So Martin Luther actually said that there's no scriptural basis to have a pope. You don't need to go to a priest to ask for forgiveness of sins. You can literally just commune with God and ask God for forgiveness of sins. Um, so he had a lot of critiques that, again, challenged the power of the Catholic Church because that is our overarching, over overarching idea for this unit and the next couple of units is that these early modern Europeans, once literate, once educated, start to challenge traditionally held sources of power. Ooh, the Anabaptists show up a lot in your CED too. Um, Anabaptists believe that baptism was only valid when one freely professed their faith and asked to be baptized. This is really different than baptism. Uh, Anabaptists are Protestant. Catholic baptism happens as an infant. And this was such a radical belief at the time that it actually led to a ton of deaths across Europe because both Catholics and like Lutherans and Calvinists thought that the Anabaptists were ridiculous, that you wouldn't just baptize someone as an infant in the church. So it's interesting, again, to like reflect on that nowadays, because I think that people hold like the scriptural understanding or like the theological doctrinal understanding of baptism a lot differently than they did then. But again, it just shows that like religion and religious views change a lot over time. Anyway, what you need to write down is Anabaptists, not liked by Protestants and also Catholics. So they were united in that thing. If you're making a little Venn diagram in the middle, you can say, hey, Anabaptists under Catholics and Protestants. So Reformation happens, this uh, drastically changes so much in European history and also leads to many, many wars, but it does lead to some cultural changes, specifically the Catholic Reformation. The Protestant Reformation happens, people start to break away from the Catholic Church for various reasons. Sometimes it's genuine religious devotion, but sometimes it's also because they wanna like weaken the power of the Catholic Church or like princes in Germany are like, I don't know about these Habsburgs. Maybe I want some political power for myself. So there are various ways and reasons why people convert away from Catholicism and toward Protestantism. But the Catholic Church actually responds by having their own reformation in which they do start to reform some of their more corrupt practices that had developed over the course of the Middle Ages in Europe. They do so by reconvening at a, a, an event called the Council of Trent. And this is where they double down on Catholic, Catholic doctrine. They publish their index of prohibited books. 
And this specific event, this council really solidifies the split between Protestants and Catholics in Europe. Um, Jesuits and earthly nuns were also sent out by the Catholic Church in order to bring people back to the one true faith, to bring people back to Catholicism. Jesuits are responsible for going over to the Americas to bring Catholicism to specifically Latin America, and they were important and influential in setting up schools and education systems. Also write that down. And then the Catholic Church as well as wealthy monarchs using during this time who predominantly were Catholic because they wanted to ally themselves with church, utilized Baroque art and architecture. So this image right here is an example of Baroque art and architecture. You can think it is just like very passionate, very expressive, very emotional. When you were looking at the inside of a church, this was supposed to be like heaven on earth. Again, if you were like a poor peasant living in Western Europe and you got to go into this every Sunday, yeah, this would probably like be what you would think heaven would look like. And again, the Catholic Church is sponsoring a lot of that to draw people back to the Catholic faith and not show off how much power they have. Political effects of the Reformation, oh, oh, led to religious wars in Europe through, I mean, really from like what, 1520 to 1648, so for like 130 years. These religious wars plagued Europe. The two that you really need to know the most about are the Thirty Years' War and the Holy Roman Empire. Um, hopefully you've done that Thirty Years' War DBQ that came out a couple of years ago. I think that many would say that the Thirty Years' War between Catholics and Protestants within the Holy Roman Empire started out with genuine religious devotion of like people actually wanted to become Protestant, people actually wanted to stay Catholic. But then over the course of that time period, it became increasingly political as outside states like Sweden got involved. And so people, rather than just fighting for their religious beliefs, started fighting for their country. So you do need to know about the Thirty Years' War. I'm going to talk about how it ends because that is a marker event and a marker date in AP European history. Wars of religion in France. Oh, I love the French wars of religion so much. Um, what you need to know is that you should just go watch all of my TikTok videos about the wars of religion in France. Um, it ends, they end with uh, the Edict of Nantes, which is establishes religious pluralism in France. It says that as long as you are not in Paris, you can practice Protestantism, but um, Paris is worth a mass. So Paris is going to be Catholic. Most areas in France are going to stay Catholic, but you can freely practice Protestantism as long as you're not in Paris. And ooh, a lot of Huguenots, so French Protestants, were exiled or left France during the wars of religion in that country. And a lot of them came to the United States or went to Prussia, which will become important. Um, if you want to really greatly summarize this in your brain, these religious wars tend to be fought by the Habsburgs, who are very strong, political, powerful family that are Catholic. And then the non-Habsburgs or the people who want to weaken the power of the Habsburgs who tend to be Protestant. So that's a great way to kind of just keep that in the back of your brain. Habsburgs are Catholic, non-Habsburgs are Protestant. They're fighting against each other for power. Oh, the peace of Westphalia. This is the peace that ends the Thirty Years' War. And you can just write down these four things. The peace of Westphalia will show up on your AP European history test in some way. It is such an important date. It shows up all over your CED and you need to know that it allows national self-determination and sovereignty. So what that means is that after 30-ish years of fighting within the Holy Roman Empire, because so many millions of people died, these leaders got together and said, huh, what if, uh, what if we just like let them decide for themselves what religion they want to practice and like not fight them about it? radical concept. It actually was a radical concept at the time. So I'm saying that in jest, but it allowed for you to determine the leader in your nation to determine for themselves what religion they wanted to practice. It sets the stage for national self-determination, which is a continuity in European history from this time period to now. It led to a huge change in political boundaries. It led to the rise of France as a major European power because the Holy Roman Empire had been so weakened as a result of the, the Thirty Years' War. And this plus the Council of Trent like officially end 
and cement the division between Protestants and Catholics. Europe is no longer going to be united by Christianity in the way that it was during the Middle Ages. We now have two specific denominations of Christianity. In Western Europe, we have the Roman Catholic Church and then various Protestant denominations, and there's no going back. There, there's a strong lock in between the two of them. Um, social effects of the Reformation. Oh, it is my dream. It is my dream that there's going to be a CCOT about women's roles in European history because it is like we've never had that and we need to have one because we talk about women so much in this course and it's always this debate about women. What role should they play? How involved are they going to be in politics? How involved are they allowed to be in education? Oh, a CCOT over women. I'm calling it right now. That better be one of your essay prompts this year. Anyway, this, the Renaissance, this rise in literacy and the Protestant Reformation all continue to contribute to this debate about women. If Martin Luther says that we are all equal under Christ, does that mean that women also have the authority to preach and teach the Bible? Or is that still only restricted to men? Um, this debate about women continues as we get into the scientific revolution and the Enlightenment. Like, what is a woman's role? Is she allowed to get educated? Is she allowed to pursue these diverse academic interests? Or is her role mainly to still be a homemaker? So that debate continues from this time period in European history to honestly, like, 2024. So again, going off of that, like, should women be educated? Uh, when women start getting educated, witchcraft accusations increase because how dare she know things and learn things? She must be a witch. Specifically, witchcraft accusations increase in Protestant controlled areas in Europe. Because, yeah, we'll just leave that there. Um, also, small communities, now that there is not like a universal religion tying and binding people together, friendly reminder Catholics and Protestants are under the banner of Christianity, but they have very different doctrinal beliefs in how that faith is practiced. So now that they're not all united in that common faith practice, um, who regulates morality? Because we believe different things now. So local governments start to say, this is what is allowed. This is what is not allowed. So this contributes to the rise of a secular state, which had happened really, you know, since the Renaissance is now continuing to happen as a result of the Protestant Reformation. This is where you have like public whippings and brandings and shivari and like stocks and public humiliation and all of that starting to take root because governments are like, I guess we need laws now. Okay. Oh my gosh. This is perfect timing. So let me go through the three kind of recaps of everything that I just said. And then I'm going to spend time talking about every single person or event that you need to know for your AP test from units one and two. So culturally, Europe underwent immense changes as a result of the Protestant Reformation. Literacy increased, education increased, the use of vernacular language increased, and national identities started forming. Again, you are like figuring out who you are in the language that you speak and you're writing about that. All of that stuff is going to help form national identities. Politically, wars were waged over the right to practice Catholicism or Protestantism. And while these wars were fought out of genuine religious devotion, they were also exploited in order for a certain state's political and economic gain. So it's not just out of like what you actually believe, but of course people are gonna get involved for political and economic reasons as well. And then socially, local governments began to regulate morality. The debate about women continued and witchcraft accusations increased to the turmoil that plagued Europe in the 1500s and 1600s. Okay. Okay, give me one second. Gigantic comments. Freedom from AP Euro gang, what is happening? This is so great. Okay, um, let me show you what you actually need to know according to CED. Get ready to like take a picture, take a screenshot. If you threw your phone across the room, <laughs> don't get your phone across the room because here are your absolute must knows for units one and two. Like these are in the course and exam description. These are not illustrative examples. These are key concepts. These are people and things that you need to know. So in your brain right now, you can even check off if you know these things. Petrarch is that pre-1450 humanist. He was the guy who I said 
um, coined the term the dark ages. So he starts to focus on individual and human achievement really prior to the Renaissance officially starting. Desiderius Erasmus is that Christian humanist in in the Low Countries. So that would be, um, the Low Countries would be like the Benelux countries. So the modern day Belgium, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg. So the Low Countries. As the Renaissance spreads north, that is where it spreads to. Henry VIII, who I will talk more about in a later unit. Hopefully you know things about Henry VIII. But I guess, oh no, I can guess I talk about him now. Um, right, Martin Luther's like, 1517, let's break away from the Catholic Church. Henry's like, I want to get a divorce, let's break away from the Catholic Church. And in 1521, he, in 1521, he forms the Anglican Church. And then again, uses that to consolidate his power in England. And I will talk more about England in the next unit, because we're going to talk about the rise of constitutionalism. So I will for sure talk about Henry VIII more there. Elizabeth I, I will talk more about in the next unit. But right, Henry VIII's daughter, who rules as a Protestant queen, leads honestly to like a lot of wealth and flourishing in England, even though some people don't like her a lot. I think she's delightful. Martin Luther and Calvin, those two Protestant reformers that you do need to know. Italian Renaissance, humanism, secularism, Northern Renaissance, printing press, vernacular, mercantilism, climate exchange, slavery, serfdom. I covered all of those things. Hopefully you remember what those are. Um, Anabaptists, so the people that the Catholics and the Protestants both really don't like because they think that you can be baptized whenever you want to be rather than be baptized as an infant. The Habsburgs um, can end up controlling a lot of the thrones in Europe over the course of the next couple of hundred years. Uh, Habsburgs were centered in the Holy Roman Empire, eventually will transition to like the Austrian Empire. Uh, the Ottoman Empire, oh, they... I think it's in the next unit or is it in this unit um oh my gosh i think it's in the next unit but essentially they try to attack europe and they are stopped at the siege or the battle of vienna by the austrian habsburgs and that like ends ottoman influence in western europe and you need to know about that because it's important but also because like they're muslim so like that's also playing into like these religious wars that are breaking out in europe edict did not ends the french wars of religion Peace of Westphalia ends the Thirty Years' War. Holy Roman Empire, which is neither holy nor Roman and isn't really an empire anymore by the end of this unit, continues to fall apart. Catholic Reformation is a response to the Protestant Reformation. They create the Jesuits who are really responsible for setting up uh, education systems in Latin America. And the Council of Trent, right, is where the Catholic Reformation doubles down on its doctrine publishes an index of prohibited books and solidifies the division between Catholics and Protestants. Baroque art, I've talked about. Mannerism is in your CED, and I did not talk about that. Um, mannerism is, is real weird. As someone who really loves art, I can't get behind mannerist art. Um, mannerist art is like elongated and distorted art. So whereas the Renaissance focused on this classical, beautiful ideal of what a person could look like and should look like, mannerists are like, let's make it all really emo and do really dark colors and like really elongated colors and people look real strange. That's mannerism. It's just a little footnote, but you do need to know what it is. <sighs> okay. Wow, I did it in 50. What do we need? 